Today, Doctor Who is one of the BBC's biggest shows. Cyberman? But back in 2003, it had been off air for 14 years. This is one of the Thuleen. And a reinvention seemed unlikely. I think it's fair to say that absolutely nobody else within the BBC thought that that was a good idea. It was so ready to fail. Everyone thought that was going to fail, didn't they? They really they did. did. There was a, a great mood about it, wondering why the BBC was embarking on it. Yeah. When we were casting The Doctor, the press ran the front cover on We Should Cast Paul Daniels, The Magician. It was seen as a kind of entertainment, pastiche silly property. Which is absolutely what had happened to the show in the 80s. Now you see me? It became underfunded and it had lost its way and I think that was the memory of Doctor Who that lingered in the minds of the audience. My turn is in bed. I cannot see. I'm going to be very blunt here. I was 11 years old when I became a fan of Doctor Who. This is around the early 90s. And the show had already been cancelled. I became a fan of the show because it was still getting the occasional repeats, uh, particularly during the period from 1992 to 1994. BBC Two had repeated The Time Meddler, The Mind Robber, The Sea Devils, The Demons, Genesis of the Daleks, Case of Endrazani, Revelation of the Daleks, Battlefield. And that was how I first became a fan of Doctor Who. I discovered, I caught a few clips from the Sea Devils, uh, that famous, quite famous, you know, very iconic scene where the Doctors try to negotiate a peace deal with the, with the Sea Devils. And that's when the Navy, without a clue what's going on down below, start bombarding the base with with depth charges. They start bombarding the ocean with depth charges and basically they start to devastate the Sea Devil base. And the image I always remember is the Sea Devil corpses floating to the surface. Very kind of grisly image. Very tragic, poignant image, actually. Because it's like it's you're actually seeing in action, you know, mankind blind aggression. You know. You know, that, that image says it all, really. So the Sea Devils ended one one repeat season. And then later they did a repeat season that started with the demons. Now have a look at Joe's arm on the right there. You can see on the right it's in black and white, but watch how the effect is in and then it covers the black and white area perfectly. You see the colour shifting over to the right and on she goes. And this is the final version. I've never heard such a Well, the first episode of the regenerated Doctor Who series will be shown on BBC Two this Friday. I saw a bit of the demons, then I caught the tail end of Genesis of the Daleks, caught episode five and episode six. I remember episode five being the one where that was grilling the Doctor about the future of the Daleks, and you got the Thals who had just narrowly survived the invasion of their own city, and you're seeing the Daleks in action, ruthless action. And the cliffhanger when the Doctor kind of emerges with the Daleks, Dalek creatures kind of gnawing at his neck. That was a brilliant cliffhanger, and it was like, okay, now I'm hooked. I've got to see what happens next. And so episode six was, you know, so then next week, episode six, I watched that, and I was quite shocked because it ended with the Doctor losing. It ended with the Daleks winning, and, you know, the Doctor passes up a chance to destroy the Dalek incubator room. Just touch these two strands together. And the Daleks are finished. Have I that right? To destroy the Daleks, you can't doubt it. But I do. And the Daleks survive. Davros is killed, but the Daleks survive. And it looks like it's going to be, you know, most of the good guys are killed. You know, the Doctor and his companions survive, but that's about all. And the Thal survive. But it's essentially a victory for the Daleks, that episode. The Doctor loses. 
You see, some things could be better with the Daleks. Many future worlds will become allies just because of their fear of the Daleks. It, it isn't like that. But the final responsibility is mine. Not mine alone. Now, I missed pretty much all of Keys of Andazani. Then Revelation of the Daleks aired, and that was the... Um, Keys of Andazani aired, and uh, I missed that. Then Revelation of the Daleks aired, and I tuned into that specifically, because, well, it's a Dalek story. And I want to kind of see if the Doctor wins this time. And so that's how I kind of became a fan, I'd say. I got Dalek Attack on the Commodore 64. Could never quite get past New York. I got the Peter Cushing Dalek movies on video. Prisoners will proceed into the ship. Any further resistance will be dealt with in the same way. Rewatched them so many times, I've pretty much worn their magic out, frankly. I started taking regular trips to my library because they had a huge stack of Target novels there. 30 years of travelling through time and who should appear to disappear from your screens? Doctor Who and the Daleks, tonight at 7.30 on BBC One. Now, you know, when you're 11 years old, obviously, you know, the, the show looks all magical and you, you're willing to believe in the magic and, you know, overlook the faults and flaws. First video I got of Doctor Who was The Five Doctors, and for a long time that was the only Davison story I'd ever seen. Good grief. You're here. You're here. Yes, evidently. Now take it steadily, my boy, and let me help you up. So it seemed like, you know, it was this wonderful show. Although, I think watching Trial of a Time Lord that Christmas, because that, that was the 1993, the end of um, the year, they did release two box sets. They released the Daleks box set, which was a, a box set that, it was a tin box set that had, for some reason it had the art, the, it had the kind of, you know, the, the artwork from Dalek Invasion of Earth on the cover. You know, the, the last shot of the Daleks kind of patrolling Westminster Bridge while at the back backdrop of the Houses of Parliament. Even though what's in the box set is nothing to do with that. It's basically, it's the chase and remembrance of the Daleks. But the way, it was such a detailed box set, like the, the way they'd kind of indented it. Even 11, I was like, okay, you know, I'm willing to, I, you know, I want this box set. Because it's like, I want those particular episodes. And so, I remember, you know, that's what I got for Christmas. I got that and Trial of a Time Lord. I, the first thing I did was check out the chase and... Remember the Daleks. Watch them early Christmas morning. Um, it's one of my favourite Christmases. That <laughs> and um, watch Remembers of the Daleks, and I've always I thought it was such a perfect, you know, Christmas Christmas treat. That that was that was an absolute treat. Daleks moving. Father Time Lord, however, was slightly, it was an odd one. It kind of go from pantomime to really graphic horror. Cold-blooded reptile thing. It must, must die. It already has. Welcome. And then there are moments where it kind of goes into high comedy farce as well. And like, I do remember at the time thinking, because there'd been, yeah, you know, we'd had documentaries on the show, you know, we'd had, you know, 30 years in the TARDIS, a lot of retrospective to do with the 30th anniversary. And I think watching that, I did get the sense, you know, what, I don't think I'd want the show to come back this way. If this is kind of the perceived direction for the show now, I don't think I want it to go that way. And, you know, this was like 11 years old. I kind of, I got that sense that I wasn't necessarily liking the direction it was going in. But it seemed like, you know, the sense that it was, there's kind of no getting away from that comedy direction. Would I be wrong in thinking that the doctor will soon be needing a Mac and I overcoat? 
Nothing so crude. He's merely being reduced to a catatonic state. Cata what? The violent assault on his senses will trip a defensive mechanism, and his brain will switch off. He'll become a zombie. Temporarily. Long enough for my purposes. What definitely kind of crystallized for me over rediscovering the show was that the strongest stories were from the 1970s, from the late 70s, you know, you know, the Hinchcliffe era stuff, Genesis of the Daleks, Pyramids of Mars, Robots of Death. You know, that was when you had the really, really strong stuff. That's when I discovered the Seeds of Doom and Tan's Wang Chang and Horrifying Rock, and it was all really brilliant stuff. I remember, you know, City of Death was another one I really liked. And then when venturing into the 1980s, the 1980s is potluck. It really is potluck. Like, you could probably, at random, pick, say, Warrior's Gate, Kate of Androzani, and Revelation of the Daleks. And think, my God, this era was awesome. This era was really high tech. It was really cutting edge stuff. It was really intelligent stuff. You know, it makes a lot of what came before look like, you know, pat pantomime for children by comparison. I am known as the Great Healer. A somewhat flippant title, perhaps, but not without foundation. I have conquered the diseases that brought their victims here. In every way, I have complied with the wishes of those who came in anticipation of one day being returned to night. But never in their worst nightmares did any of them expect to come back as Daleks. But on an equally random picking choice, you could pick, say, Time Flight, Warriors of the Deep, and Twin Dilemma, and come to the conclusion that, yeah, this show carried on far too long. The show was allowed to carry on for far too long. Switch it on! All right, Jake, close your eyes, make a wish! I, I rest my case. <laughs> I really do. That is pretty bad. Every expense spared there. <laughs> you know, and it's probably no wonder the show ended ended as it did, and maybe the BBC's mistake was not cancelling it sooner. Well, we all know the fate of aliens. <laughs> now, some would say that's just the nature of the show. It's going to have its highs, it's going to have its lows. Every era has its highs and lows. Even Tom Baker had its occasional lows. But I would more venture that there was a lot of mismanagement in the 1980s. And that the successes you got in the 1980s were just as attributable to bad management as the good, as the, as the terrible stuff. You know, it's like the good stuff happened almost like, it was almost quality snuck in, if you know what I mean. You know, it wasn't really part of the agenda, necessarily. And so, so I would say that what we saw in the 1980s was a decline, but a very eccentric decline. It was almost like the you had freak anomalies of quality, if you know what I mean. So, how did this happen? What went wrong with the show well first of all we have to go back to what went right with the show and sometimes what goes wrong with the show and what goes right with the show are the same kind of thing you know usually the excuse people make excuses for the 1980s oh it was cheap it was underfunded they didn't have rehearsal time you know it was basically just and if you look back in the 60s same was kind of true you know they weren't very you know there was very underfunded very little rehearsal time and they had to make more episodes of the year. But nonetheless, people judged the 60s as a success because those conditions created a case of art through adversity. You know, despite William Hartnell's ailing health, he always gave his all into the part of the Doctor, and that's what 
people remember vividly the you know the the conviction he put into that role. I warn you, resistance is useless. Resistance is useless. Surely you don't expect all the people to welcome you with open arms? We have already conquered Earth. Conquered the Earth? You poor pathetic creatures, don't you realize? Before you attempt to conquer the Earth, you will have to destroy all living matter. Take them. Take them. And, you know, it was unlike anything seen before, really. One day, I shall come back. Yes, I shall come back. Until then, there must be no regrets, no tears, no anxieties. Just go forward in all your beliefs and prove to me that I am not mistaken in mine. Now, like I said, the show... The show's golden age was the 1970s, when it was kind of, you know, it was John Pertwee, you know, Barry Letts was producer, John Pertwee was the doctor, Terence Dix was script editor, and they kind of created this kind of perfect populist format, the unit show, you know, the unit family. And then John Pertwee left, Barry Letts left, Terence Dix left. So they, so then Tom Baker was cast as the doctor, and Philip Hinchcliffe became producer, Rob Holmes became script editor, and they started to do something more daring with the concept. And very, very quickly, Tom, ba you know, the, the show was getting huge rating success and Tom Baker was all, was just becoming a, you know, he was becoming like Doctor Who's first real superstar. This isn't real wood. It's some kind of artificial material like plastic. These are not real trees. And you're not the real Sarah. Get back, Doctor. I knew at once. You see, the real Sarah wasn't wearing a scarf. What have you done with Sarah? Where is the real Sarah? So those those three years of Tom Baker being at the top, they were they're generally judged as the pinnacle of Doctor Who, like you know, from Robot to Towns Wang Chang. Or rather, from Ark in Space to Tom's Wang Chang. People tend to think, well, Robot was a bit of a leftover from Barrylet's time. It was, it was a bit anomalous to the kind of the gothic horror period. And to be honest, that's my view. I look back on that period. There's so many success, successful stories. There's so many fun stories there. And, and it really does feel like, you know, it's, if you look back, it's timeless, ent timelessly entertaining stuff like The Seeds of Doom, Pyramids of Mars, Tom's Wang Chang. Genesis of the Daleks, Terror of the Zygons, you know, all these lovely stories, beautiful, beautifully done. Uh, you know, some of it's very ahead of its time, I would even say. Like, um, I feel like if you're a Buffy fan, you probably would really enjoy Towns and Chang. I feel like if you're a fan of the Scream movies, you'd probably really enjoy Robots of Death. Fan of Buffy, you'll probably, you know, you know, or even Pyramids of Mars. I think, you know, if you're a Buffy fan, you'll probably enjoy that as well. You know, a lot of it was ahead of its time, I think. Like, I was watching this alongside Buffy and thinking, you know what, this is... You know, Doctor Who was doing similar stuff to Buffy and Scream back then. Ah. This looks like it. Mm. Ah. Oh, what's the matter? Not enough? Sweaty gelignite is highly unstable. One good sneeze could set it off. Sorry. <laughs> no sign of any detonators or fuses? No. No. Nothing else. Perhaps he sneezed. So, what went wrong? Well, I think a lot of things went wrong at once around season 14, 15. Like the transition from season 14 to 15, a lot of things went wrong. Mary White has been complaining for quite a lot about the show. She'd, she complained about the show for years. She complained about Terror of the Autons a lot. From, you know, she complained about a lot of the horror in that, in that episode. You know, we actually ran into a great deal of trouble over one story where things did come to life uh, which were normal 
there was a, a, a troll doll that when it got warm uh, came to life and tried to strangle people and we got a lot of flack from that because children were really scared uh, she started making more complaints again during the Hinchcliffe era. She complained a lot about Genesis of the Daleks. She complained a lot about the Seeds of Doom, Pyramids of Mars, the Brain of Morbius. Uh, the, she's notorious for criticizing the Deadly Assassin for that particular cliffhanger where the Doctor is submerged underwater and being drowned. She made a lot of complaints about that. One particular program, and I can see it still in my mind's eye, uh, where Doctor Who... Uh, the, sh the la final shot of the episode was Doctor Who drowning. Finished, Doctor. You're finished. These sort of images, the final shots of the program, with the image that was left in the mind of the child for a whole week. And. Around this time, the BBC started to take her seriously. They started to take her complaint seriously. They started to issue an apology to her, you know. And so the BBC did promise that they would kind of try and keep the show, you know, tone the show's content down. And when Hinchcliffe left, Gray Williams took over at the end of Towns Wing Chang. Now, some have said that he was moved on by the BBC because of the Mary Whitehouse complaints. It's possible, but... I've read from I've been reading um about the revised version of About Time Four and that tends to make and that makes more of a case that actually no, that that actually the BBC had been kind of they've been kind of mixing up kind of yeah, they've been swapping showrunners around quite a while and that they probably were planning to move Hinchcliffe on after three years anyway. I think, you know, things were already in motion. And it, it, may, it might have been, you know, Mary Whitehouse's complaints might have played a part, possibly. Who knows? But Hinchcliffe leaving was a problem because Hinchcliffe had been the best producer, really. He'd had an idea of where the, where each season would go. He had a good rapport with Robert Holmes. And more importantly, I think Tom Baker respected him as the authority on the show. And when Hinchcliffe was gone, suddenly Tom Baker was all that was left. And he had a kind of more... He felt it was his show and he had to be the caretaker of the show. He was the, the last caretaker standing, really. And so he would become a lot more uncompromising. When Graham Williams took over, it was like, I don't think Tom Baker respected him at all. He kind of just said, you know, no, well, you know, I, I, I formed a bond of respect with Philip Hinchcliffe. He knew how to do this. I know how to do this. You're a newcomer to me. And so I think Tom Baker just became a lot hard. You know, he was very rebellious, very hard to control. And Tom Baker just wouldn't be told what to do. He'd go off script a lot. He'd kind of, he'd throw tantrums on set. He would ad lib a lot. He would, I think gradually he start, the show started to feel like a bit of a, you know, kind of, it could began to feel like a very unpleasant environment, I think. Someone needed to step on his toes, basically. And the problem was, Graham Williams kind of was in charge of the show on the understanding that, you know, because Tom Baker would occasionally threaten to leave, he'd threaten to resign if he didn't get his way about stuff, and it got a bit ridiculous. It got ridiculous very fast, and it would happen every season. If if his if his personality clashes with Tom Baker got serious, and one of them had to go, he was basically told, "You're the one who's going. Tom Baker stays. You go," because Tom Baker's the star. Um. He's the big audience draw. So, you know, you've got to try and compromise with him. The BBC kept him very micromanaged. Like, the head of serials would often, you know, they'd look over scripts, you know, a lot more punitively than before and say, okay, you need to uh, watch that bit with the um, with that particular violent scene or that scene with the, with the you know, that, that, that human, you know, the, the references to, you know, sacrificial cults kind of thing. You can watch this bit, that bit, you know, just, you know, they, they basically, you know, all these notes about the stuff about what, you know, the stuff they need to avoid. And you can kind of tell watching the Hinchcliffe era and the Williams era that the Williams era, it feels like some, like some of the edge was taken out, that the, the show has been micromanaged in a, in a far bigger way. And, you know, a micromanaged product is not as good a product, if you know what I mean. 
So those are three problems together. And then the fourth was the impact of inflation. In which, you know, the, the BBC was hit by inflation. I think the show already suffered because Philip Hinchcliffe had massively overspent on Tang Wing Chang. And you can tell in years after, like, the show had kind of... It was the brunt of the litter most of the time after that. And... But inflation was really bad. I mean, it was a, it was a, you know, the entire country was hit badly by inflation. So the show did start to look a lot cheaper and worse. This was the around the time that Star Wars hit the screen, hit the hit the cinemas, and suddenly, you know, Star Wars made sci-fi look really expensive and really, you know, look really kind of high tech and glossy and, you know. We did spectacular and extravagant, and yet Doctor Who did not have a chance in hell of competing with that. And I think the production team, you know, Graham Williams and Douglas Adams looked at that and thought, we're done for. There's no way we can make Doctor Who look as good anymore. And I do think, to a degree, Graham Williams, as much as he tried, there was a kind of pessimism he always had about the show. And... And I think that was when fans started to kind of turn against the show. You had the show looking cheaper. You had the show emphasizing comedy more, you know, mainly from Tom Baker and writers like Douglas Adams. They were kind of thought, well, we can't do horror. We can do comedy at, instead. Let's play up, you know, because Tom had already had a certain comedic persona to him anyway. So they thought, well, we'll play that element up. A lot of fans were complaining, no, you're kind of making this too farcical. You're kind of making Doctor Who seem like a sender of, it, of itself. Castellan, as Castellan, you are responsible for security on Gallifrey in general for my safety in particular. Are you not, Castellan? Uh, that is civics. Castellan, I don't think you're very good at it. That's just my opinion. I'm a little president. Still, every oligarchy gets the Castellan it deserves, eh, Castellan? Uh, yes, well, never mind. Just clear up the mess when you want a moment. Ian Levine particularly made a lot of noise about the, his feeling that the show was just turning into halt, into sheer farce. There was the thing that the show just, you know, a lot of fans just said, you know, the show's not taking itself seriously enough. And so then, of course, at the end of season 17. The, now, the season was supposed to end on Sharda, but the Sharda shoot was brought to a premature end by strike action in the studio. And I think Graham Williams just decided, I'm done. I'm done with this and leaving. And he nominated um, John Nathan Turner, his production unit manager, to take over. Because John Nathan Turner, kind of, he'd overseen for him whilst. During he'd ever seen Power of Crawl, he kind of stood in as the producer whilst Graham Williams had a holiday. Um, so technically, Power of Crawl is the very first John Nathan Turner story. And during City of Death, it was John Nathan Turner who suggested to him, you know what, it's actually cheaper to film this in Paris than to recreate Monte Carlo in the studio. So, you know, so that compelled him to do a top down rewrite of the script against the deadline. And it turned out being turned out to be to be one of their best stories. Turned out to be the best story. And, you know, so most people would probably hope, well, you know, this is, you know, this, this you know, so basically Graham Williams thought, well, look, this guy knows how to budget. You know, budgeting the show has been a complete nightmare. John Nathan Turner could be good at good budgeting in this, you know, give the show to him. And um, now John Nathan Turner didn't, have any, didn't really have any experience on the writer's side of things, unfortunately, which is the big problem. That ended up being a big problem. And, you know, John Nathan Turner was, he was a showman. Like, he'd, he'd written pantomime, uh, that kind of thing. He was, he'd never really written, you know, TV scripts. He, he didn't really have any involvement in TV scripts, didn't really understand them that well. But, you know, he, he was a people person. He kind of, he mingled with, you know, he, he liked having a certain stable of, you know, acolytes around him. Like, he preferred yes men to talent, basically. That's the miserable truth about John Nathan Turner. And so he got the job in 1980. He basically ended up being overseeing Tom Baker's final season. And he he made this bold statement that he was going to make some serious changes. And to be honest, the BBC had installed Barry Letts to be his executive producer. And Barry Letts felt also that, you know, this show had kind of gotten too silly. It was time to make it serious again. And so they looked to recruit Chris Bidmead to be script editor. He was going to try and make it all kind of hard science again. Well, he was going to make it more hard science than it had been since, arguably, since the very first Dalek serial. 
you know, because Doctor Who wasn't typically a hard science show. And so um, that was it. We were into the John Nathan Turner era. Now, from reading the the biography of John Nathan Turner, you know, the the Life of Scandalous Times of John Nathan Turner by Richard Marsden, comes across very much that John Nathan Turner really what he wanted to do. He wanted to do Doctor Who. That really his plan was to just do Doctor Who maybe for a year or two and graduate from that into doing he was he, he wanted to do soap really. And I think you can tell from the very first season. You can tell from the very first season that basically like I think anyone producing the show in nineteen eighty it had inherited a pretty good setup. You had Tom Baker as the fourth doctor, you had Romana as the companion and the canine as the toy dog. And I think most producers would have tried to retain that and thought, well, you know, that's a good dynamic. It's an entertaining dynamic. The public like it. But John Nathan Turner decided to make changes immediately. He kind of decided, okay, well, I want to introduce Adric. You know, Adric was a kind of, you know, he had this idea he was going to bring Adric in. He wanted Romana gone and he wanted K9 gone. He felt, look, they're too clever. I need companions who aren't too smart. You know, you know, if all you know, if the entire cast is too smart, then it kind of spoils the ability for the audiences to invest in them. Um, so he introduced Adric, and he had the idea to write Romana out. Now, Lala Ward, by this point, her relation, you know, she'd formed a relationship with Tom Baker. They kind of blossomed, you know, when they were filming City of Death, it was clear they'd kind of blossomed into a romance, but. That was on the rocks by the time they started doing season 18. In fact, Peter Moffat, uh, when he was directing State of Decay, he said he'd film a scene with the two of them. You know, the fourth Doctor and Romana side by side, you know, looking at the little landscape. And the moment he said cut, scenes over, they would get as far away from each other as possible. And he, he you know, he could tell there was a real, you know, things were bitter at this point. And so I think that was why, you know, Lala Ward herself came to John and said, I, I'd like to leave this season. And so it was kind of, it wasn't this difficult conversation of, well, I'm thinking of writing out the Romana companion. Um, Romana, you know, Lala decided she wanted to go. And that was, that fitted with what John Nathan Turner just wanted and decided. He wanted kind of the show to, he wanted the show to move forward, really. He wanted to kind of, make big changes now i don't know what he particularly planned to do about tom baker i don't like i don't get the sense that he ever thought i'm gonna i'm gonna drive tom baker out the show like a lot of fans say that's what he wanted to do but i don't think that was really in the cards i think plan was to rebrand tom's doctor you know redesign the costume give him a kind of rebranded look and if he sticks around, fair enough. But let's change the dynamic, the, the companion dynamic. And so that's when he introduced Adric. You know, he had this idea of this boy wonder, awful dodger type. On paper, it was it was a great idea. In practice, Adric was just annoying and unpleasant. And Matthew Woodhouse couldn't act for Toffee. And he got on the goad of pretty much the entire cast. Like Tom Baker didn't like him, Lala Ward didn't like him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so then so Lala Ward, you know, Romana and Canaan were written out in Warriors Gate. You know, Adric was already a companion by this point. Now the thing is apparently John Nathan Tudor did retain the script for Sharda. And he retained the film for Sharda and he had apparently planned to do a remount of it because, like, it was kind of close to completion. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. That's right. So Newton invented punting. Oh, yes. There's no limit to Isaac's genius. Isn't it wonderful how something so primitive can be so... Graceful? No, simple. You just push in one direction, and the boat goes in the other. But... 
I think in the end, the problem was he was already making big changes to the show. He, he you know, so, you know, it was a, it was a fourth Doctor Romano canine story. And I think once Adric joined in full circle, it wasn't really possible to fit Shadow in because it's like, well, you know, the Doctor and Romano are in East Face now. Why would they go to Cambridge? How they, how would they be able to get to Cambridge? And where have they put Adric? Um, yeah, you, you could only really have done it during Megloss, ju ju just after Megloss. Meg after Megloss was the last time they could have done Sharda. Unless, of course, they were to, say, do one of those really corny, cheesy, you know, you know, Tom Baker telling, you know, Tom Baker's doctor telling Adric the story of, you know, what happened on, and tell it through flashbacks kind of thing. Silly, corny idea, but I think that's probably what John Nathan Turner might have gone with. And so, but but instead, you know, it was all forward motion. Doctor! Yes? Shh! Hurry! Coming! I think Christopher Bidmead was not keen on doing Shadow at all. He wasn't keen on doing State of Decay at all either. I mean, State of Decay was a, a story they dug up from the rejects bin. State of Decay was originally... I think it was originally called the Vampire Mutations or the Wasting. It had various working titles, and it's Terentix had submitted it for season fifteen. You know, right after Hinchcliffe left, there was going to be this vampire story. He'd written a script, and he'd written a script for episode one and a treatment for the story overall. And the BBC shut it down and said, "Well, actually, we're doing a production of Dracula later this year." This is 1977. Like the version of Dracula they did was um, the one with Louis Jordan as Dracula. Lucy. Lucy. Brilliant, by the way. Brilliant. You know, it's well, you really, really well worth checking out. BBC's version of Dracula was fantastic. Um, and they said, well, we don't want Doctor Who to do a vampire story because that's going to look like it's sending up the, the version we're doing. So they shut that down. And so Terence Dix quickly had to write something, a replacement. And so he ended up doing Horrifying Rock, you know. So in some ways it was a happy accident. Then we got Horrifying Rock and Stay Your Decay. So when John Nathan Turner took over, um, and they were, it looked like they were nearly out of. They 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 were looking for you know any scripts they could use. They went to the rejects pile and they found, you know, Stay Your Decay. They found you know what Terentix had written for, you know, the vampire story. And so they said, well, let's let's dig that one up and let's do something out of that. Um, so they kind of got Terentix involved again. I like a ghost story. Do you want to hear one? No. It's about a race of giant vampires. Vampires? Mm. They came out of nowhere. And swarmed and swarmed. What did they do, Doctor? Swarmed, that was the word he used. They swarmed all over the universe. And they were so strong that one single vampire suck the life out of an entire planet and as it happens to stay decay ended up being probably the best story of the season i'd say but johnny centennial was keener on doing it than bid me was bid me was not keen now this is johnny centennial's first season in charge um now i do think johnny centennial always had an authoritarian streak it always he did have a kind of he was a bit of a prima donna, frankly. But particularly on this season, he had, like, Tom Baker, who was as rebunctious and rebellious as ever. And John Nathan Turner wasn't prepared to stand for him. Like, you know, it was, I think it was kind of clear, well, you know, I'm, I'm not Graham Williams. I'm not going to... I'm actually going to stand up to you this time. Um, he also had Barry Letts as his executive producer. You know, he was kind of... He was put in to look after John Nathan Turner in that first season. 
and basically do the micromanagement in, you know, place of the head of serials. And sometimes, you know, Baroness would bring Tom Sticks along to the studio um, just to see how things are going. And Jonathan Town actually said, no, I, could you not bring him? I'd rather not have the old guard around. I, you know, it's, it's, as far as I'm concerned, I'm in charge here. I don't like having being overseen by the old guard. It's my show, basically. I'm the producer. You know, I don't like being looked over. And that kind of, I think, that defined the rest of his era, where, you know, Eric Sayward was trying his best to get Jonathan Turner to bring back writers like Robert Huggins and Terrence Dix. He said, look, you know, they, they, these are great writers. We should, you know, we should bring them back. That You know, they, they know how their show works. And Jonathan Turner was like, oh, no, I don't, you know, I don't want to bring the old writers back, you know, and so it kind of became a fight to get them on. But I think it stemmed possibly from that. Yeah, kind of defined his mindset from then on. And it wasn't really to the show's benefit at all. So, Adric. So there's Romana left, Adric. Ad Adric joined Romana left. Then in Keeper Tracking, I think John Nathan Turner kind of like looked over Keeper Tracking and said, well, I think what it needs is it needs the master in there. Yeah, let's turn, let's have Melkor turn out to be the master. That would be a big surprise cliff. That would be a big surprise reveal. And I think he just kind of took note of the fact that Sarah Sutton as Nyssa was quite good in the role. And so he decided on a whim, let's make her companion as well. Yeah, you know, I'd like her to be the companion too. And then I think John Nathan Turner was kind of given some feedback by the head of serials about well look you know we're looking to try and expand we're looking to try and entice co-funding from australia and i think from that john ethan turner got the idea let's actually bring in an australian companion and so he said about the idea of doing logopolis well doing he, he set up a character outline for tegan basically and so, you know, that so she was kind of going to be fostered on the show next, really. I demand to see who's ever in charge of this shit. And so you can tell already the show's kind of undergoing this kind of cast swelling. We got Adric, you know, the Doctor, Adric, Tegan and Nissa at once introduced very rapidly. In a kind of quite, you know, on a whim, in a very kind of contrived fashion, on a whim. It did seem to stem from John Nathan Turner's soap sensibilities. Of, let's, you know, let's turn the doctor, let's let's turn the TARDIS into a soapy domestic sphere where you've got, you know, these rather shrill characters yelling at each other about, you know, arguing all the time about stuff, you know, drama, drama, drama kind of thing. He's looking for something called a zero room. Zero room? I'll go. That boy never even said thank you. It was very much a departure from the dynamic he inherited, which where it was just, you know, Tom Baker and Romana, that kind of, you know, that lovely double act. A copy of the book was to be installed in certain time vehicles. What time vehicles? Oh, I don't know, I forget. What time vehicles? Type 40, I think. The TARDIS is a Type 40. Is it? Now, I think Bidmead wrote Logopolis, and it, I think Bidmead felt that John Nathan Turner's idea for the Master was to make him a very pantomime villain. And Bidmead wrote the Master in that to be as nasty as possible, as a kind of, to backlash as hard as he could against John Nathan Turner's idea. In fact, I think the originally the script they had was going to be something called Project Zeta Sigma. It was going to be a very, very different Master story. And, um, very different indeed. But John Nathan Turner had, his, had this idea that he was going to 
he kind of put all kind of weird suggestions into the script about, well, actually, I want a scene where the Doctor lands the TARDIS by right next to this other police box that's on this particular motorway, you know, just to kind of, you know, have an iconic shot of that. And it's like, I'm not sure the story really needed it. Maybe it was a nice visual, though, but th th that was the kind of thing you'd kind of put in suggestions like this. And it ended up, of course, being Tom Baker's last story. I think Tom had already announced that he wanted to leave. And so, so Logopolis ended up being kind of a, a mishmash of being Tom's departure story, of being Tiga's introduction story, and a lot of whims of John Nathan Turner to have, you know, police box in there and have the master in there. And it did feel a bit over, you know, kind of, it was almost a bit too high concept. It was also a bit kind of, had to do too much at once but it was kind of it wasn't very pacey though at the same time i mean i suppose what you can say about legopolis is that it was a very much a expect the unexpected kind of story you didn't know what was going to happen next yeah that kind of there was a sense of impending doom about it um which you know you can only really create once i suppose and so then peter davison was cast and Tom, and johnny had made a point of i want Peter Davison to be as much of a contrast against Tom as possible. You know, you know, Tom was invincible for the most part. Um, I want Davison to be more vulnerable, more fallible, I want to be more serious as well, you know. I want to get away from the comedy stuff. Doctor, are you all right? How on earth did you... You're spoiling my concentration. Come on, old girl, just don't let me down now. Don't let me down now. And I think also, John Nathan Turner was also very keen to court fan opinion. Like, he liked going to conventions. He liked going to conventions. He liked meeting with fans. He was very... He very quickly kind of struck up a rapport with Ian Levine, who was a very, very kind of vocal critic of the Williams era. And he was the one who's kind of kept on putting ideas to John Nathan Turner. Over. Well, you know... This is what the fans would like. The fans would really like it if you brought the Master back or the Cybermen back or all these other things from the past, you know. So I met John Nathan Turner the first day or the first week he was hired as producer. Being able to make John listen to me, I often wanted to see a fan's dream come true. He started bringing the Master back and the Cybermen back and everyone was so knocked out and giving John such adulation that he looked more and more to bring the big things back. So, but that kind of became the routine. And Levine would kind of suggest things to the production team. And he'd occasionally look over script and say, okay, well, I think you should change that. You know, you need to change that bit. Like, I think, I think in space, I think in state of, state of decay, like the, the ship that crashed is the Hydrax. Now, originally, apparently it was called the Hyperion. And I think Levine said, no, you've got to change that. Cause there was an, there was a ship called the Hyperion back in the mutants or something, I think. He said, you've got to change it, you know, you don't, it's, you know, make that change. And then gradually it kind of be bigger things. And eventually by Warriors of the Deep, he'd be kind of writing him with about 30 something, you know, complaints and inconsistencies of, look, you know, you've, you know, you really haven't got a clue. I got the first draft of the Warriors of the Deep. Before I'd look at a script and I'd have five or six amendments, I gave him the script with 28 major, and when I say major things, there was about 28 different things because some of them were numerically repeating themselves all through the episodes. So when I gave that in, John was a bit freaked as, oh my God, I better show this to Eric. Previous producers had had a scripting background, but John Nathan Turner was not a writer. Uh, he didn't really have much interest or much background in creative writing. So almost all of that was left to Eric Saywood. Draft two came in. He tried to rewrite what I put in, but that had brought a whole new set of problems in. Because when draft two came in, there were 27 more major fundamental continuity problems. You forget. Twice we offered a hand of friendship to these eight descended primitives. And twice we were treacherously attacked. Which is, which is the problem really, because Really, if it wasn't for Ian Levine's kind of you know nagging, we probably wouldn't have the production. The production people probably not have thought that Warriors of the Deep was worth doing in the first place. And really, it wasn't. You know, it was a terrible idea. And I think Ian Levine was kind of prodding them towards terrible ideas of let's do a continuity 
obsessed version of the show. Let's have it. Let's have it. Let's bring back Omega. Let's bring back the Black Guardian. Let's bring back the Silarians and the Sea Devils. Let's bring back the Santarans. And it just got out of control ridiculously fast. But, you know, Jonathan Turner loved the fact that the fans were adoring him. And he, and so I think if he was in that echo chamber, it just made sense. Well, the fans want it. So that's what I'll give them. And he lost sight of the fact that he was actually supposed to be making the show for the public. And, you know, he lost sight of that very quickly. Like, so it was very, very bad, badly managed. I think, I mean, by my reckoning, John Nathan Turner probably should have left after time flight. Like the big moment in earth of course, is when it ends with Adric being on the freight of the crashes. And basically Adric is killed. This is shock moment. Hedrick? Doctor! Now, the, in the episode after Time Flight, there's a scene where Tegan and Nyssa are grieving. And they're kind of, you know, they're for about a minute they're hysterically grieving Adric and then the doctor suggests that they take a holiday and to cheer ourselves up and it becomes just very quickly forgotten it's a ridiculous mood shift it's weird strange and it's clear that when Russell wrote the show he kind of decided that he was going to that's the thing he had to change he had to kind of make sure there was there was a sense of emotional repercussions in the show and he felt that that was what was missing from the 80s But he felt like John Nathan Turner just wanted to kind of move quickly onto the next, the next episode, the next big thing. And sometimes, you know, he'd kind of, but sometimes the next big thing was the, just a revival of yesteryear's big thing. And I think the master was kind of typical of that. It was like every time Tegan and Nyssa met the master again, it kind of was glossed over that, like, the implications, you know, because in Legopolis, the master destroys, master murders Tegan's aunt, Auntie Vanessa, and he destroys Legopolis, and he's basically walking around with the body of Nissa's father, uh, Tremus. So, you know, he's caused a huge amount of grief to both Tegan and Nissa. And yet, in subsequent episodes, this is never really brought up. You know, when they encounter the Master again, it's just, oh, it's the Master again. It's kind of, there's no real kind of, the kind of the human emotional reaction that should be there isn't there. I've been sent here by the High Council to help you. Oh. Is this man a friend of the Doctor's? Anything but. Well, they're talking as if they were friends. That's what worries me. Now, the sensible thing to do would be to just not have the Master back at all. If the show can't deal with the emotional repercussions, then it would be best to just kill the Master off, as you know, as seemed to happen in the end of Castro Valva, and just this issue doesn't need to come up at all. But John Nathan Turner seemed to think the Master was such a good villain, who, that it was worth bringing back, that he said, well, you know, well, I think it's worth bringing the Master back again. And so that could never really be dealt with. And I think that's kind of the point, is that what was sensible, what should have been the sensible move, was overruled by the sensation, the idea that it'd be a sensation to bring the Master back. But not in a way that would actually address what that should mean to Tegan and Issa. You must be too hard on the child enlightenment. Uh, she has uh, spirit and courage and a, a fine independence. Such qualities will be useful. She'll come round in the end. Never to tyranny. I can never forget that my father was killed by a tyrant. Well, now you're being unreasonable, Nyssa. One simply can't compare his majesty to the master. Now, if you look at Chibnall's era, Chibnall did seem to try and address this somewhat. Like, the Battle of Ranskor Avkolos is where Graham decides he's going to take revenge on, on the Zimshar, or Tim Shaw, as uh, Jody keeps calling him. And you have that kind of big, and so you have that, that kind of clash 
between the Doctor and Graham because he's saying, I'm going to take revenge, and then Jodie's saying, no, you're not. If you do that, you're out. You know, you're not gonna. You're not gonna do this. You're gonna. If you do that, you're as bad as him, basically. And I think that was Chibnall trying to basically do the what the eighties had failed to do. It was like, should there have been? You know, it's almost like if they'd done that, if they'd had an episode where Nissa or Tegan decided, I'm going to take revenge on the Master, and the Doctor has to tell them no. They do a whole episode about you know them wanting revenge on the Master. Yeah, you know, if basically it was almost Chibnall trying to make up for that and say, well, this is how I would do it. And of course, you can see in in Jodie's last episode, of Power of the Doctor, it's actually that is actually brought up. You actually see, um, you know, Sasha Dewan's master remembers killing Auntie Vanessa. And he's taunting Tegan about it, and she's saying, "Tegan, Joe Funker." <sighs> How's your auntie Vanessa? Do you keep her in a little doll's house? I'm going to enjoy watching you locked up in a tiny cell. That's right, you tell me. And Ace! Or should I say Dorothy? Didn't the doctor ditch you? Yeah? Little fallout with your Machiavellian maestro. Last time I saw you, you were half cat. Man's allowed to experiment. You know, she actually said, I'm going to enjoy seeing you locked up. So it's almost like, finally, after... You, after... <laughs> What, 30 years? 40 years, rather. Yeah, after 40, after, you know, pretty much 40 years, finally we get to see, you know, that addressed in the show. By Chibnall, of all people. But I think the success of Earthshock was the, Earthshock was the big success. And I think, but it was only, it was something you could only really pull off the once. And the plan was that, Season 20 would replicate that with the Daleks. <laughs> you know, Eric Sayer would kind of get the script, would be getting the brief to do a Dalek story. Yeah, because by then, John Nathan Turner had been going to conventions in America. He'd actually met with Terry Nation. He'd just about managed to negotiate the right to use the Daleks. And because of that... They were able to do a Dalek story. They had the right to do a Dalek story, but it was felt that because of Terry Nation's, you know, Terry Nation was still proprietorial about the Daleks. And so it seemed agreed that the best way of handling a Dalek, the best, you know, the best thing to do would be to have the script editor, Eric Saywat, do the script because then he's easily on call if Terry Nation kind of looks at the script and says, oh, I don't like that bit. You need to change that bit. Then, you know, well, you know, turn nations, you know, you know, if Eric Sayward's on call, we can make the amendments necessary. And I don't know if that's why Resurrection of the Darks ended up being a massive mess, but I think Eric Sayward said that he just couldn't really gather together the scripts he needed for season 20. And it felt like John Nathan Turner was always imposing his idea of what it should be. You know, he felt like it, Ian Levine wanted more continuity elements, so he would brief... Johnny Byrne to do a something involving Omega. You know, the story had to involve Omega. And, you know, and he felt like the Black Guardian had to be involved. The Master had to be involved in the King's Demons. And John Nathan Turner also had this master plan for a character called Turlo, this, this kind of villainous companion. And that was John Nathan Turner's big kind of, you know, he, that was his high concept companion. You'll find me the most accommodating of partners. But murder? I'm not sure I could go that far. You will be destroying one of the most evil creatures in the universe. He calls himself the Doctor. And he thought that, so he probably thought, well, that's going to be, you know, it's going to mean a cliffhanger to each episode. And probably, you know, because John Nathan Turner had said that at this point, he'd noticed that the best way to get publicity for the show was A, to, you know, cast particular, you know, famous celebrity guest stars. You know, usually that got talked about in the papers. Threatening to do away with the TARDIS, you know, do away with the police box design. That tended to get the show in the papers. And changing, you know, and um, companion arrivals and companion departures. And so we decided, well, we need a, we need this season, we need a new companion. That'll kind of, you know, 
attract a lot of publicity and we need to write this around so you know introduce turlo then departure of nissa and so there was the hope that would kind of get the show majorly in the papers and i think eric sayward felt that well, look, i'm not really getting this you know i i I, I, I'm not getting any control of this show now. It feels like it's all out of my grasp now. You kind of, it's almost like it's being done to the whims of in the veen. And so a lot of scripts fell by the wayside. And I mean, I think Eric Sowell was kind of quite, he was, he wasn't very good at following up script as well. I was always looking for writers who I thought would be suitable for the show. We encourage people to submit. And then from that, we could build up. Virtually none came through the post, unfortunately. I don't know how much it does nowadays, but virtually none did then. So it was a matter of looking for people you thought suitable. We would put out the word that we were looking for ideas. And if we liked it, we'd ask them to develop a, a scene breakdown. Eric then became the linchpin, really, of Doctor Who, because the ideas were around him. He, uh, he worked with the writers much more than John. If we were doing six stories and I had four or possibly five writers who were getting on with it, that would have been fine. And then I could, I could then bring in someone who was new and inexperienced and, and help them through it. Eric was getting more and more frustrated because he couldn't find writers able to write for Doctor Who and the stalwarts like Robert Holmes and Terence Dix knew it in their sleep, but John refused to use them. Initially, I wasn't very keen on uh, having writers back to the show who'd written before. It, it often happened, even with sometimes with experienced writers, that the whole concept, one of a 90, 100-minute story, seemed to be beyond them. It was very difficult. I was stuck with this position of, of carrying people at the beginning of the season. And I just, however good you are, I just cannot take you on. What I'm looking for is someone who's good and can do it. Not for, for, not for another one, I have to nurse. That was, I think, another part of the problem was just... John Nathan Turner, like the BBC kept John Nathan Turner in the job because no one else wanted the job. George Galassio had been offered the job in 1980. He didn't want it. And Chris Bidmead only did, like, he, he worked himself overtime in the office on the scripts of season 18, and he said, I want, a ri I want a raise. And he was refused, and so John Nathan Turner really had to kind of scour, you know, he, had to kind of, he was, like, stuck for a new script editor. We were hanging on by our fingernails on that show. The restrictions were so enormous. You shot a scene, it was good enough. You pushed on to the next scene, that was good enough. Maybe the next scene wasn't quite good enough, but nevertheless, we'd have to buy it because time was running out. And then it was some poor editor's job to string this whole together, the whole thing together and try to make something broadcastable out of it. And, and that was the nature of the show. The budget was tight, the time, timing was very, very tight. And there was, there was, uh, there he was, Peter Davison taking over the lead role from someone who was very experienced about dealing with exactly those sort of constrictions. And I think this is kind of telling because like Robert Holmes had been the best script editor the show had back in the 70s. Like for the poetry era, for much of the poetry era, Terence Sticks had been script editor. And then Robert Holmes took over for about three or four years. Like he kind of stuck around till midway through season 15 and then I think he kind of, he just moved on. He, he tended to concentrate a lot more on Blake 7 and the like that, but he wrote a lot of Blake 7 scripts. You know, there was that feeling that everyone was moving on to greener pastures then. Because then Anthony Reid kind of script edited um, the tail end of season 15 and the key to time stories. And then Anthony Reid moved on to do Hammer House of Horror. And then Douglas Adams took over script editor. And then he moved on because obviously Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was such a success. He started to just, he, you know, he suddenly had all these book deals. And Ben Mead, of course, left because he wasn't getting the raise he wanted. And I think what was happening was you were realizing that suddenly everyone was departing, departing really quickly as fast as they could for greener pastures. You know, no one really wanted to stick around on Doctor Who anymore. And I think there was the feeling that when Eric Saywad got the job, it was like, it was out of dire necessity. It was, look, look, I need a script editor. You know, someone who isn't likely to depart for greener pastures. And I think Eric Saywad, I, I 
I think like he, you know, he took the job, didn't really have anything else lined up. So he ended up sticking around, but it was, it was a very unhappy arrangement. I think it gradually became an unhappy arrangement. Like I think at first, if you look at the visitation and Earthshock, you know, first you can tell Eric Selwood kind of here, he's contributing scripts. He's a very enthusiastic writer and, you know, seems to get the kind of family adventure, action adventure appeal of the show. It seems to get it. A dead man you saw what was in the cellar the great reaper death and then when he became script editor he was started to kind of have you know he had his ideas about what the show needed now and they were kind of very much in conflict with what jonathan turner thought the show should be and he did say that he felt that series season 20 was so out of his control and it became so kind of pantomime <laughs> And kind of, you know, kind of dry and listless, really. He felt, okay, what what we need is a season finale that's going to be as action-packed and violent and dark as possible. And so he wrote Resurrection of the Darks to be as brutal as possible. You know, just death, 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 death. Exterminate! You know, ridiculously so. I think he was just desperate to prove that Doctor Who could be adult TV, that it could be dark and violent and dramatic. And the entire story has that tone of it of, you know, are you horrified yet? You know, look at how horrifying all this stuff is. It really does have that desperate air of, you know, being desperate to prove something about itself. <laughs> And that carries on, on into the end of Warriors of the Deep as well. And that just starts to affect the entire tone of the show. And I think it made it a very, very charmless show indeed. They're all dead, you know. And it seemed to inspire no confidence in the Doctor as a, as a hero at all, because it was like, well... You know, the Doctor's supposed to be the hero, he's supposed to be the one who makes a difference, but Sourwood stories seem to be written specifically in mind to go as downbeat as possible. And the Doctor being useless, effectively. You know, this all depends on the Doctor failing. And, you know, that's the end goal he has in mind. He didn't care if that means the Doctor comes across as a complete idiot. And so that was where I think the show started to really just it was terrible, I think. It was just awful. I think if you were f someone who used to watch the show to see Tom Baker be the hero of the show, fought to make a difference, then you're basically being, being incentivized to go look elsewhere for your heroes now. It was just bad. It was just awful. And... Then there was Colin Baker, and Colin Baker, I think, had some. I think had some good ideas for the Doctor. He had some ideas of getting back to the, yeah, you know, the Machiavellian anti-hero aspect of the Doctor. He seemed to have a bit of an idea of trying to get the Doctor back to his anti-hero roots, his Hartnellian roots, and that was probably the best idea they'd had with the character in a while. And it meant there was a bit more to his Doctor, but even then, they botched it badly. I don't know why they watched it, but they did. And so I feel like with Colin, he just got off to a terrible start with the twin dilemma, made the worst possible first impression they could. And 
the show just felt felt a bit kind of you know just a bit too shock heavy but it wasn't really it was kind of almost like the shock punctuating very very thin stories and it was just terrible really you don't even know what a peary is do you peary no huh. i'll tell you a peary is a good and beautiful fairy in persian mythology the interesting thing is before it became good it was evil and that's what you are thoroughly evil although when the cancellation crisis happened it happened right after the two doctors and revelation of the daleks and i think a lot of fans do look back on those stories and feel like you know what it felt like the show was kind of be it was going somewhere there it felt like it was finding itself properly finally it was becoming something uniquely it's almost like the show had found it you know it kind of found an identity um it felt like eric Selwood had kind of finally started to get it now Maybe, just maybe, the show is starting to become something good. But of course, Michael Gray decided the show had had its time and he decided to suspend it. So why did you cancel the show? I thought it was rubbish. <laughs> I, I thought it was pathetic. I mean, I'd seen uh, Star Wars yeah. and I'd seen Close Encounters mm -hmm. and E.T. Mm -hmm. And then I had to watch these cardboard things probably clonking across the floor trying to scare kids you know mm. you just sit and laugh at it um, we've got the ratings here because apparently um, when it was axed to use the tabloid expression <laughs> um, it was beating match of the day and Wogan at the time in the ratings it, was it, it really? <laughs> <laughs> you don't care do you? no no um, <laughs> Well, actually, what happened was there was a huge press campaign, Save Doctor Who, you yeah. know, and when newspapers get a lot of letters on mm -hmm. a subject, they mm -hmm. think it's a hot topic. They got thousands and thousands of letters from the three fans who were up all night writing <laughs> yeah. thousands and thousands of letters, and I was up before the BBC Board of Governors for this uh, thing, and uh, the upshot of it all was, uh, I did cancel it, it came back eventually later mm. after I'd gone, um, but I, I got an award from the Doctor Who Appreciation Society of America. Uh -huh. What was uh, the nature of this award? Well, it was a lovely little gold statuette of the rear end of an... Of, of an animal, and it was the horse's ass award <laughs> for, from the Doctor Who Appreciation Society. And I keep that at home in a small room somewhere convenient. Where <laughs> I was. Now, it might have been planned to cancel it outright, but I, know, I think maybe the backlash forced him to bring it back. You know, because it did go on a huge fan backlash. The reaction was so severe that the Doctor Who fans at one point threatened to pick it the House of Commons with Daleks, you're going to have to make some more shows. Because if they do that, it'll be on the front page of every newspaper in the world. Now, did the backlash matter, really? Would it have mattered? Would it have, because, you know, in the end, it just prolonged the end, prolonged the inevitable. Um, like, if the show had just ended on Revelation of the Daleks, would that have been a bad thing? Would the show have been any worse off, really? Probably not. You know, Revelation of the Drugs is a fine story to end on. You could still have Russell T. Davis bring the show back years later. Now, at this point, John the Turner was doing a lot, lot more pantomime. Um, and yeah, he, now he had a cast of Doctor Who he was able to draft some of the cast into his own pantomime production so he was able to do bring Peter Davison and you know Nicola Bryant and Bonnie Langford I mean that's part of the reason why I think he cast Bonnie Langford was to you know, expand his um, pantomime repertoire you know his empire of pantomime stars um, and this was of course the one this was the decider that broke both John Nathan Turner's connection with Ian Levine and Eric Sayward, they both kind of decided 
that was the last straw for them, basically. And so they both decided to go rogue on him. Never mind the Sydney Carton heroics. You're not signing on as a martyr yet. Go away, Mel. Go away. That trial was an illusion. Ow! Oh! You've ruined everything! Now, Eric Sayward, he said that he was actually given the task of writing Bonnie Langford's introduction piece, her, kind of her, her audition piece, because he did nag John Nathan Taylor. You can't just cast her. You've got to make sure she's good in the role. So, you know, Eric Sayward was trusted with writing the audition piece, and he, he, was very, he admitted he was very sneaky and snidey about it. He deliberately wrote Bonnie Langford's dialogue, Mel's dialogue, to be as complicated as possible. He, looked, he went to the thoughts, looked up all the big words, just to see if he could trip her up, you know, because he had this idea that she wouldn't be able to do it, that, she, you know, she wouldn't be able to pronounce half these words so that she'd slip up or she'd kind of fail the scene. But actually, she, bef and he said, you know what, she actually, <laughs> I did my best to trip her up and she kept her poise. She was, she was that good. You know, she was that professional about it, which is kind of, it shows just how devious Eric Sayward was, how kind of snide and conniving he could be at that point. And that, that, that was the thing. I felt like he wasn't able to fight his corners necessarily, except by being snide and underhanded. So it, it seemed like that was the problem, that John Nathan Denner was too controlling and he was too powerless. And so if he wanted to affect change wherever he could, it was, you know, it, he'd do it in a very snide way. And I think you can tell that looking at the show, the way that you know, stories that perhaps should have got a happier ending were kind of warped to get a miserable ending instead. There should have been another way. Eric Sowart started to push the envelope. Like his first script for the series was The Visitation. And for the most part, it's a, you know, it's probably as close to family adventure as the Davis and you ever got, really. The only part that's really kind of graphic is the fine, is the ending, when the Terraleptals burn in their barn. Can we try and help them? You can kind of just about get away with it because obviously these are, you know, alien looking creatures. It's so it doesn't have the same kind of horror of seeing, you know, humans being burnt alive. But it is kind of, you know, it's probably the most graphic image of that season, really. The Doctor is involved in adventures that deal with violent people. Um, and sometimes the only way to deal with violence, unfortunately, is to be violent in return. How dare you touch me! Oh. Personally, I feel that if you display violence, you should show it for what it is. I don't think it should dwell on it. I don't think it should be gratuitous. But I think that when you do display violence, you should show it hurts. Now, his next script was Earthshock. And that was kind of a... That was a story that they had to fill in. That was basically a, a replacement script. It was rush-written replacement script. Because... Christopher Priest had submitted a script called The Enemy Within, and the script fell through, basically. And so Eric Stowart had to write a replacement really quickly, which became Earthstock. It was kind of the, and it ended up being the surprise return of the, uh, of the Cybermen. Ended up being a very, very action packed story. It kind of ended up being the pinnacle of the show, really. It was kind of like the, the pinnacle of the era, really. It was like a lot of fans rated this one. Right. Now, being a Cyberman story, this is kind of where Eric Sowart started to define his style more. Like, the visitation, that's kind of Eric Sowart doing an historical. And, you know, he turns his hand to it quite well, to be honest. It's strange that 
that wasn't the direction for the show he pursued. You know, you can tell there's a bit of the English, the history teacher to say what, and you would think, you know, an era overseen by him would do a lot more of the historical type stories with aliens, I suppose, you know, the pseudo historical, as, as, as it were. Now, the visitation is all right, but Time Warrior is much better. And, you know, Time Warrior is where Eric Sewell drew a lot of his inspiration, really. Um, but Earthstock is kind of more where Eric Sewell, as we know him, like this is this is the beginning of Eric Sewell, you know, fermenting his reputation as the more violent, nihilistic writer. Because, you know, Earthstock is a very, very violent story, very brutal story. The side men in that are really presented as cold, ruthless, merciless killers. Now, the the key scene in that, for me, is, like, um, Professor Kyle's, um, it is quite early into the story, she's the she's lone survivor of this expedition that has been massacred by the Sidemen's killer androids. How many of you were there down there? Eight of us. What were you doing? survey the particular cave system we were in has just been discovered it's proven to be rich in fossils you all paleontologists and geologists just makes sense scan complete sir negative no sign of life and you spend most of the story thinking that you know she's going to be the guest companion you know she's the guest protagonist this week you know she's the yeah, as the sole survivor, the final girl from that encounter, you think, well, she's the um, she's our hero, she's our guest protagonist. And then midway through episode three, she is suddenly killed off. There's a scene where the Cybermen start to breach the TARDIS. The Marines try to keep, you know, try to close the door, TARDIS doors on the Cyberman, but it's, you know, it's forcing its way in. It's got its gun in its hand. The Marines are trying their best to get the gun out of its grip. Uh, Kyle makes a rather stupid, reckless move to, you know, get a gun and try to shoot the Cyberman, but it shoots her first. And so she's killed out of hand. And that's a very, very kind of that becomes a very Sayward trademark of, you know, shock death, you know, surprise death, left, you know, out of left field, a character you think is going to survive dies. Now it works here because it's a sucker punch. It's a real sucker punch moment. Um, it also works because it's kind of presenting the grim realities of war. It's like, you know, there isn't really, there aren't really kind of you know invincible protagonists in war. You know, in war, you know, it's a fight to the death and you you know, you might die out of hand, you know, die out of hand. You know, the, the conventional rules of heroism that you get in TV, they don't apply in war. You know, being heroic sometimes is what gets you killed in war. Um, also, it fits very much with the Cybermen. It's basically the scenes telling you a lot about how strong and ruthless and determined the Cybermen are and that basically... You know, you know, if a Sadman's got a gun in its grip, you know, it's, you're not getting that gun out of its hand easily. You know, it's it's where you really see the killing machine side of the Cybermen. So that worked. The problem is, it's like same with it's like with Moffat. You know, you know, Moffat like he had his tropes, like you know, he had his, you know, the there was usually the the child character that the Doctor kind of is curious and concerned about, you know, the mysterious child character, um, the timey wime, you know, like the empty child, of course, is the, the mysterious missing, you know, lonely child kind of thing. And then, of course, in Girl in the Fireplace and Blink, there's the whole timey wimey stuff, which, you know, everyone loved at the time. And then we got into his era and then it was just, you're always getting mysterious children. You're always getting timey wimey. You're always getting kind of you know um, playground type monsters in the dark. 
and surprise revelations and twists. And there came a point people started to get sick of it. And it's like suddenly, you know, he'd repeated himself so much that the, and to, to a point where it wasn't really, wasn't even coherent anymore. And it just started to, it just started to become like he was repeating the same trick again and again to the point where it was just unpleasant. Or, you know, it just wasn't entertaining anymore. It was, it became obnoxious through repetition. It became moronic through repetition, even. Now, Sayward is not as clever as Moffat. That goes without saying. So Sayward tended to repeat that trope of, you know, well, the best way to end a story is, you know, and have it be dramatic and impactful is just to kill everyone off. So Eric Sayward's style was, you know, well, let's just... Let's just end the story with a total body count. And I think a lot of this was because that's how Blake 7 had ended. Blake 7 had been kind of seen as the the darker, edgy rival to Doctor Who in the late 70s. And the final episode is one where the Federation surround the, the rebels and basically they're all gunned down. And, you know, it's a bleak, unhappy ending. It's, you know, it's, you know the, the bad guy, the, the, the bad guys win, the good guys lose. And I think Eric Selwood looked at that and decided, well, I'm going to imitate the, well, okay, the best thing Doctor Who can do is imitate that. And you can see this again and again in his era in stories like Warriors of the Deep, Resurrection of the Daleks, Attack of the Cybermen. It's all, how can we end this story with the Doctor surrounded by the dead? The Doctor losing. <laughs> You know, it'll have the same kind of impact, possibly. And the whole thing of, you know, and it was the same kind of thing, like with Professor Carl's death, it was the whole, well, you know, how about we just have it again, the case where the, you know, character, the likable character is killed out of hand by a spiteful enemy, a spiteful enemy that's probably dying, but has decided they're going to take, that they're going to take one of the good guys with them before they die. The commander wasn't so lucky, I'm afraid. He's been shot. And that ends up being what Warriors of the Deep is all about. Eric Selwood does everything possible in that script to ensure that the human characters die. Even to the point of having the Doctor tell the companions to revive the Silurians so that one of the Silurians can come round and kill the commander. The last surviving Silurian is Iktar, he's been revived. And all he wants to do is get his gun and shoot Vorshak in the back. And Turlo has to shoot him. So it just ends up being, you know, it just becomes nasty. It just becomes, well, what is the point of this? And Resurrection of the Daleks even makes it a plot line. You know, this is a story in which the Daleks themselves are dying out from the Movellum virus. And it has made them more dangerous. It has made them more deadly and desperate. And basically the entire story is about the fact that they're, if they're going to die, they're going to take the entire guest cast with them. And unfortunately, this kind of requires the Doctor to be useless at stopping them. Like, there's a brief bit in the episode one. When the Doctor's first encounters the Dalek, he instructs the military how to take the Dalek's ice stalk out, and then he rushes the Dalek, and in a struggle, he pushes the Dalek out of the warehouse window. You know, so flings fl it to its death, basically. And for that moment, you think, great, okay. The shows, the stories had this really bleak and horrible intro with the uh, Daleks breaking the Davros out of prison, massacring the prison station crew. You think, okay, now the Doctor's on the scene. Now the Doctor's involved. He's going to kick some ass. He's going to turn the tide. And we're going to see the Doctor be the hero of the hour. And he ends up not being the hero of the hour. He ends up being distracted by this whole business of this having to hunt the escaped mutant from the Dalek casing. Then he goes to the Dalek spaceship, immediately lands into a trap, spends most of it captured. Then he tries to kill Davros, but he can't go through with it. And Davros actually tells him to his face, you're soft and weak. You can't, you know, you know you've got no courage. You've got no, you know, you haven't got the conviction to do this. You're weak. 
And so that you know, Davison just kind of flees the room, unable to kill Davros. Then he gets involved in the action in the warehouse. He brings some of Elm Plague. He wipes out most of the Daleks. But by that point, it's too late. The Daleks have pretty much killed everyone. So it just ends very bleakly indeed. And it just, you kind of, you're sick of it by the end. I'm tired of it. What's the matter? A lot of good people have died today. I think I'm sick of it. You think I wanted it this way? And Warriors of the Deep is is the same. It's the whole, you know, in the first episode, the Doctor discovers the hexachromite gas. You know, they've got this, you know, the sea base has these, you know, illegal canisters of hexachromite gas, which are deadly to all marine life. Then in episode two, of course, the, the sea devils begin to break in. So basically the Doctor keeps quiet and he basically just says nothing whilst the crewmen, you know, well, the sea base crew, defend themselves in vain from a greater, you know, from a more powerful force that the Doctor could easily tell the humans how to defeat. And, you know, they could survive this. You know, this is a one story which I think the Doctor is, you know, the Doctor of the classic series is portrayed far worse than Jodie. Yes. And these human beings will die as they have lived in a sea of their own blood. And to me, that was the real problem, was the heartlessness of this era, the misanthropy of it. It wasn't just all the death. It was the whole, we were in this era where no one cares, or worse. And in Warriors Deep's case, what's worse is the only people the Doctor cares about are the people doing the killing. You know, the, the Silarians who are doing the killing, doing the genociding. And no one else is meant to be cared about. Everyone else is just, you know, pathetic, just easily dismissed. It was a, it was a horrible brewing misanthropy. And it's like, again, it's this whole thing of, you're not watching the show for any good reason. You're not watching the show for, to see a hero save the day. They're all dead, you know. But I think Eric Sauer definitely felt that John Lee Turner's direction for the show was very pantomime. And this was the best way to go against that, was just to, you know, kill, kill, kill. You know, death, death, death. You know, that will show people that it's serious drama, or at least it's meant to be serious drama, and it's got things to say about war. And it just ended up being crap. It just ended up being misanthropic crap. You know, that had nothing coherent to say. It was like the mad ramblings of a... It was like the deranged ramblings of a creepy pacifist suicide cult, really. You know, like, that was basically the message of War of the Deep, is, you know, war is bad, violence is bad, humanity is bad, it'd be better if we just let the enemy kill us all. I sometimes wonder why I like the people of this miserable planet so much. Now, Michael Gray kind of stepped in. And... He decided after Colin Baker's first season that he was going to suspend the show. He was going to put it on hiatus. Like, he was brought in with a, you know, under instruction to do some downsizing for the corporation. And, you know, he was never a fan of Doctor Who or sci-fi in general. And so he decided, you know, it was time to rest the show, really. I felt that Colin was just getting really into it, just beginning to become comfortable and able to inject that extra element. The six o'clock news from the BBC with Sue Lawley and Nicholas Witchell. And then it's chopped. Doctor Who is to take a rest. After the production team was criticized by senior BBC management for being complacent. The programme itself is too violent. And I'm a bit responsible for that because I encouraged people to do it. So it was my fault and I was very much upset. But the person who was upset most of all, of course, was John Nathan Turner, and that's the only time I've ever seen him cry. John came down almost in tears. I can actually still see it now, because he was so upset. And he came across to me and said, this is what's happening, he says, and I've got to go and lie down now. Gray didn't like it. 
He didn't like the show, he didn't like the show at all. He thought it was too violent, too unpleasant, too disgusting. I thought it was rubbish. And when pressed for answers as to why, over the years he's tended to kind of flip between it was too cheap and unconvincing, it was pathetic, it would never have scared anyone, to actually saying it actually got too violent. And I think it was a case of he was right, but like a broken clock is right twice a day. It was violent, it was misanthropic, it was miserable. It was not good television. And I think in a way, Michael Gray, like on the um, season 22 Blu-ray set, he's actually interviewed fully. Like they finally get to interview him properly and he gives his reason for why he kind of didn't like it. And he said he just felt that it was a very, he felt that it got nasty, it got pointlessly nasty and that it was just being done for shock value. And really, if you watch Warriors of the Deep, if you watch Resurrection of the Daleks and Attack of the Sad Men, you can, the stories vindicate him. Even if he's being disingenuous, you know, that's his take, that's his statement. And it's hard to look at those stories and not feel like his statement is vindicated. And the truth of the matter is that... As much as a lot of fans feel kind of you know, passionate about you know about it, I do look at that period and think, you know what, this is a period of the show where it's stopping the show I loved. You know, I've got no real love for this era apart from a few occasional you know freak anomalies of quality like Revelation of the Daleks or Enlightenment or the Five Doctors or Kaiser and Dazani. Yeah, there's some good stuff there, but the show in the main, I couldn't love less. It was made on a very, very small budget, and it had got into a vicious circle. Because it wasn't successful, nobody had given it the money to increase its production values. So it was looking increasingly shabby, and the audience were perceiving it as such. It was dying from lack of inspiration, neglect, and lack of institutional willpower, really. I mean, that's the truth. So, the height has happened, and there's a little part of me that thinks maybe if the height has hadn't happened, maybe just maybe. If you look at Revelation of the Darks, it feels like maybe just maybe they were finally carving a direction, proper proper direction of how to, you know, do Doctor Who in a way that was kind of you know, you know, that basically appealed to. An 80s sensibility of what Doctor Who was about, you know, the action, thrills, and adventure. Like, Revelation of the Dark seems to get it right, and I feel like, from listening to the audios the Big Finish did of the Nightmare Fair and Mission to the Magnus, I get the sense they were getting it right again. That, you know, Nightmare Fair, you know, set at Blackpool Pleasure Beach with a Celestial Toymaker, it seemed, from listening to it, it sounded like it was nailing the zeitgeist of what, you know, the what a family audience in the 1980s would have wanted. and So if Michael Grade hadn't interfered, it's possible the show was kind of... was going to naturally get back to being, you know, family fun entertainment. Because I think even Eric Sayward felt maybe that he'd pushed the violent direction too far. Like he did say, um, when asked about Resurrection of the Arts, he did say he thought that he went too far with it, really. That he... You know, he said he felt that it was there was too much incident. You know, there just ended up being a lot of, you know, badly acted death scenes constantly to the point where it just got obnoxious and, you know, unbearable. Like, it just, just got to the point where you got sick of it. And I think even Eric so I'd, you know, watched the final result and thought, oh, my God, this is, I really wrote this. This is, this is terrible. And it might be that he kind of learned his lesson by this point, that this isn't quite what the show is meant to be. And... Much of Trial of a Time Lord does bear him out. It does, like, Mysterious Planet and Terror of the Vervoids do kind of, you know, do play on the lighter side of things. Now, Mind Warp doesn't, but that's largely because of John Ethan Turner. Like, you know, Nicola Bryant had watched Tegan's departure, and she basically leaves saying she's just fed up with the, the horrors of the adventure, and she just wants to leave, and... Nicola Bryant had said to Johnny Turner, I don't want an ending like that. I want to go out with a bang. 
And so Jonathan Turner whispered to Philip Martin, kill Perry off, give her a death scene. You know, that's how she's got to go. She's got to go like Adric, basically. And it ended up being a kind of a... Basically, it's a story in which the Doctor turns evil, but we're not quite sure. Is he evil? Has his, has his mind been corrupted? Or are we seeing the... Is what we're seeing on the Matrix screen, you know, fabricated lies and that kind of thing? And I'll, I'll return to this question, but basically the entire premise of the Trial of a Time Lord Arc is the Doctor is on trial for allegedly being criminally negligent and causing more harm than he prevents, you know. You said the truth couldn't harm you, yet I have a feeling I'm attending a lynching party. Tell them you had no choice, Doctor. There's always a choice. Doctor, you stand accused of genocide. The evidence is incontrovertible. The verdict is guilty. No! Your life is therefore forfeit. Take him from this court. No! Leave him alone! It's kind of satirizing what the BBC was saying about, you know, well, the Doctor's gotten too violent, the show's gotten too violent. You know, we need to make it kind of family entertainment again. Now, in Mind Warp, that's a story in which the Doctor seems to have turned evil. And it turns out, you know, that it's tampered evidence by the make by the Valiant. The Valiant's tempered tampered with the Matrix to misrepresent the Doctor. And I think for me, my point is I could live with a story in which the Doctor turns evil, potentially. I could live with a story in which Perry I could live with the finale of Perry with a Perry with Perry Swan Song being one in which he dies. Having both at once, though, I'm not comfortable with. I'm not having it comfortable with it being Perry dies because the Doctor turned evil and abandoned her. That just sits so horribly wrong with me. Now, a lot of fans like the Perry's death scene because mainly because Nicola Bryant acts it so well. Like she's converted into Kiv. Basically, she ends up becoming a vessel for Kiv, and she has this bald cap, and she plays Kiv in such a menacing way. Like she is, her performance as Kiv is blood curdling. Protect me! I am the Lord and Master. And then, of course, she's killed in a shock moment. A lot of people feel that that's a great shock moment, but. I've never liked it. And it kind of sets the trial up to fail, really, because the next story, of course, is Terror of the Verboids, where the Doctor has to present a case for how he's improved. And I've realized this over the years, that there's nothing... It's like the trial carries on as though this is valid evidence that redeems the Doctor. It's like, but Perry's still dead. This doesn't change that. This doesn't, you know, Perry still died because of you. This doesn't redeem you at all. Nothing in this can redeem you. And so it's strange, strange that the story and the cast of characters and the Doctor think that it does in any way redeem the Doctor. And of course, Terror of the Verboids is the story that introduces Bonnie Langford. And like I said, that was Eric Stelwell's last straw. In fact, Eric Sayward, the well, actually, no, the last straw for Eric Sayward was when Robert Holmes died, midway through writing the finale. The, the final story was going to resolve everything. And, like, he was developing dementia at that point. It was, like, it's sad. I mean, if you watch The Ultimate Foe, episode one, it's kind of, we're seeing the... It was almost like the last ride of Robert Holmes' imagination. It's brilliant in that regard. Processing is very important in this establishment. I'm sure that even you will understand that such things cannot be rushed, sir. Oh, I don't know. I've always been a bit of an iconoclast by nature. You can't go in there, not without an appointment. Ah, Doctor. It's like you would not get this in any other TV show. Like, so it's kind of, in that sense, I think it's kind of worth seeing. Yeah, it's Rob Holmes' last real burst of imagination in the show. With you destroyed, 
and no longer able to constrain me, and with unlimited access to the Matrix, there will be nothing beyond my reach. And that's part one is seems to be all Robert Holmes. Part two is Pip and Jane Bacon. That's because Eric Stowe had tried to finish the story based on Robert Holmes' notes. He decided to end on a big cliffhanger where the Doctor and the Valyard fight it out in this behind this time vent. And presumably the next season the Doctor would emerge victorious. Say what decided this is the you know a, a good way to end it on a cliffhanger and leave the audience wanting more. And John Nathan Dunner got cold feet and he decided to back out and he said, no, change the ending. I want a happier ending. Um, and I think John Nathan Dunner had also decided after deciding to go for the big thing of, you know, Perry's death, he decided to renege on that as well and decide, I'm going to have it revealed that she's alive and well, you know, you know, the cop out ending, the, the happy ending. And Eric Stowell said that John Nathan Dunner was always going for the, pantomime endings and i do kind of look back on the period and think when you know i barely remember any stories in john nathan turner's era that had any kind of an uplifting ending at all we could maybe say time flight maybe fort of doomsday maybe castro valva but a lot of the time i mean warriors gate ends on a pretty bleak note Legopolis and you keep attracting Legopolis and on an incredibly bleak note. Earthshock obviously ends on a bleak note. Terminus is incredibly bleak. So is Modern Undead. So is Ark of Infinity and so is Warriors of the Deep and so is Resurrection of the Daleks and Attack of the Sidemen. Most of, most of the stories from that period are very bleak indeed. And yeah, you know, they don't really suggest at all that. Jonathan Turner prefers the pantomime walk-down ending. Time Flight is the only one, and the Ultimate Foe is the only, the only one that really kind of screams of a, of, you know, John wanting the pantomime walk-down ending. Those are the only real times that becomes apparent. And it does lend to the theory, well, is the reason why we get so many downbeat endings either, you know, a case of Chris Bidmead, or is that just a case of Bidmead and Eric Sayward deciding that they're going to rebel against John Nathan Turner? And so it just seems to, from that, it just seems like, well, you know, it seems like John Nathan Turner just wants, well, it seems like, you know, Eric Sayward just wanted to make the show as miserable as possible. He felt like that's the only way it could be impactful. And it was miserable, and it wasn't good as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, that was Eric Sayward's final straw because he wanted to preserve Robert Holmes's version of the script. And he also wanted, I mean, I don't know if it necessarily was Robert Holmes' idea to end on a cliffhanger, but it's what Eric Sayward wanted to do. And he didn't want it cheapened by going down the light pantomime route. You know, it was like John Nathan Turner kind of changed his mind out of the blue. And for Eric Sayward, that was just maddening. He was obviously he was grief stricken about the fact that Robert Holmes had passed away as well, and he'd lost such a good writer, and he was now seeing his work being cheapened by this impossible boss. All my travelings throughout the universe, I have battled against evil, against power mad conspirators. I should have stayed here. The oldest civilization, decadent, degenerate. And rotten to the core. <laughs> Power Mac conspirators, Daleks, Sontarans, Cybermen. They're still in the nursery compared to us. Ten million years of absolute power. That's what it takes to be really corrupt. And so Eric Sell went rogue. He, like, if you actually read the letters between him and John Nathan Turner in Richard Marston's book, it's heartbreaking. You actually see the complete breakdown of trust. You know, that John Nathan Turner is trying to, you know, talk reasonably to Sayward in these letters and correspondence, and Sayward was just getting more and more paranoid, more and more hostile. You know, you know, the, the contempt is dripping, contempt is dripping out from him. And then, of course, Eric Sayward went to Starburst and spilled the entire beans about, you know, the years he'd worked with John Nathan Turner and how petty and how negligent he'd been as a producer. 
No, I've read the art, the interview, and I feel like a lot of it is pretty. I can sadly believe it. I can believe that. I can believe he was that petty. I can believe he was that difficult to work with. I think Eric Selwell was a problem behind the scenes as well. I think Eric Eden Levine was a problem behind the scenes as well. It was a mess behind the scenes, frankly. And so that was when, and so with Bonnie Langford, that's when Eric Sayward decided he was done and Ian Levine decided he was done. And so, and John Nathan Turner probably thought he was done. He probably thought, okay, well, I've done Trial of a Time Lord. Um, he then got an edict from the BBC that he had to terminate Colin Baker's contract and say, look, we've got to, um, BBC feel that you've had your time as a doctor. And, you know, this was not what John Nathan Turner wanted. John Nathan Turner wanted to keep Colin Baker going. I was asked if I would do the dirty work, and it was literally on the understanding that I was leaving the show as well. I kind of thought, oh, well, what an awful way to end, but at least I'm ending. I couldn't find anybody else to do it. And, the, and actually, we'd lost the will to do so. They said, oh, we'd like, we want you to do it next year. And, and this time it was a stranglehold. There was no choice in it. I was instructed to do it. You know, I think there was the feeling that the show needed a new face or something. But, but it was clear the BBC were just micromanaging the show again and they were just but micromanaging it with a name that they could make it fail and this time actually justify cancelling it. Say, so, well, we gave it a chance to get the ratings back. It lost, even though, you know, and... They did all kind of snide and nasty, you know, deliberate things to make sure it failed. Like they cast, they put it up alongside Coronation Street and that kind of thing. They killed us through scheduling, I think, because of, at that time, Coronation Street was the, it was the biggest hit on British television. It was, it was the mountain. It was absolutely a monster. So moving us from the Saturday night slot and putting us up against Coronation Street is basically like, putting an infant on, on the M1 and letting him try and walk across to the other side. We were doomed. I mean, we were sent, up, sent, sent out on a suicide mission. We all know why the series ended. The series ended because um, the BBC at the time was entirely run by people who hated science fiction. It's that simple. That's why there was no science fiction on television on the BBC for like 10 years afterwards. They didn't like it. They were mostly public school, Oxbridge educated people who feared more than anything else the embarrassment of their peers. So they deliberately tried to sabotage it. and But they kept John Nathan Turner on, on the show. I think they just felt, well, look, we, what do we do with John Nathan Turner? Because we don't really think he's good for anything else but Doctor Who. We don't really trust him with any other projects. Um, he's the only one who's left you and seems to know how to do this show, really. We don't want to just fire him and make him unemployed. And there is a demand for Doctor Who, I guess, so we've got to kind of keep it going as long as we can. Should you have left earlier? I think, um, yeah, I mean, but it wasn't for lack of trying. It wasn't for lack of trying. I didn't want to break any records. I really didn't. I didn't want to be the longest running producer at all. I, I just wanted to do a stint. And I, I felt that the, the time that I'd finished my stint was that 20th anniversary special. Andrew Cartmel became the new script editor. He was a fairly young, radical, left-wing type. Big comics book fan as well. Big fan of sci-fi, big fan of comic books. You know, graphic novels, that kind of thing. And he was kind of drafted to become script editor. I suppose one of the things that we did on my era of Who is that it did have a certain bite of reality to it, like a street level reality, notably in survival, which is set on council estates. And I think it's the way to go because social realism is the ideal backdrop for a science fiction fantasy story. But once you do start shooting in a recognizable London suburb, you are presented with the challenge of actually telling a story that operates in the real world. That arose particularly in Remembrance of the Daleks, set in London in the 1960s. The companion is gonna look in the window of the boarding house and discover a sign that says no coloreds. I think this is rich and valuable social critique. 
and he went he was invited to a meeting with Jonathan Powell, you know, the head of serials. Jonathan Powell was asking him, you know, your impression of Doctor Who, who is Doctor Who for? And Jonathan, Jonathan and um and Andrew Cartmel said, Well, I believe that Doctor Who is for everyone. And Jonathan Powell shook his head and said, No, Doctor Who is for children. And says, you know, just understand you're making a children's show. As far as we're concerned, it's a children's show. You know, it got too nasty in the 80s. We're going to make it a children's show now. And so that's what they had to comply with. But Andrew Carmel wanted to sneak in a bit of agitprop and, um, you know, some kind of darker sci-fi ideas. And Andrew Carmel had his own issues with the Eric Sayward era, like he did describe re-watching a lot of the you know he tried to familiarize himself with the show by looking through old old videotapes of the older episodes and i think by the time he got to vengeance of varos and he was saying you know what i'm not liking this it's clear where the show's gone wrong it's too violent too nasty the doctor doesn't do much he's not really the hero that he should be and by this point you know andrew carmel had been reading graphic novels about batman and the Watchmen, and I think he had this idea of the Doctor could and indeed should be like Doctor Manhattan in Watchmen. You know, he should be this kind of Machiavellian character with a master plan. And, you know, Eric Seward's version of the Doctor is just not that at all. Eric Seward's version of the Doctor is just this hopeless loser who keeps on failing just so you can contrive to have as high a death toll as possible. By the time the 1980s were coming, people were used to a faster pace, they were used to more complex characters, and I think that there was a simplicity about the way Doctor Who was doing things that was making it look increasingly out of step. And so a lot of the McCoy era was very much an overcorrection of that, and, and my, that's my take. I think it was too much of an overcorrection. You're a pitiful, sentimental clown who enjoys crying over spilt milk. And spilt blood. But let's get on with the consultation. I had to prove how I could be strong enough and stand up to evil villains. Hmm. Like, I think it worked in Rem Remembrance of the Daleks. I think it didn't work so well in Delta and the Banner Men or Paradise Towers, where the Doctor just somehow able to turn the tables on the villain just because... Well, for no reason at all. It just seemed to be that's what Andrew Carmel wanted to happen, and so it just happens. And it just doesn't really make sense. It just feels like a, just feels like pantomime. It just feels like, you know, no one's believing this. If you know what I mean, this isn't something you can believe in. I came here under a white flag, and I will leave under that same white flag. And woe betide any man who breaches its integrity. Let's step aside. Release those prisoners. I do feel like it kind of it was too silly at the start. The McCoy is one where I feel like it was a bit too silly at the start, a bit too serious at the end. Like I think season twenty six, a lot of fans rave about it, but for me, I think it's a season that takes itself way too seriously. And I suppose it ends the show on the right note, I guess. The companion who was usually female was too often there to ask a question and trip over and need to get rescued. And I think audiences were quite tired of that. And it was only towards the end of the decade that a kind of hint of emotional intelligence crept in. He said I was an emotional cripple, a social misfit. Ace was the first step to what we have now, where a companion is a fully rounded, complex character. It's not true. Believe me. And it was a note in which a lot of fans said, well, look, you know, look how good it was getting. And if they just kept it on, it could have been great again. But I do think it was at the end of its run. It was kind of, it was, it was due. Now, there is a big part of me that thinks it was probably due at the time when Tom left, really. I mean, revisiting the era... In 2005, it was a culture shock because I'd just seen Seeds of Doom and I'd seen Towns Wing Chang, and I had this impression that this was, you know, that yeah, he really did feel like, you know, it's great that they've brought it back, you know, and I really want to see more of this. And then when I, the more I looked at the 80s stuff and the stuff after, the more I thought, okay, I'm beginning to regret 
wanting to see more of this because now I'm actually seeing more of this and it's making me wish they'd made less of this. <laughs> you know, like I watched The Invasion of Time and I thought, well, that's that was a major disappointment. You know, the idea of, you know, an invasion of Gallifrey should be something really thrilling and they've just done it in the most boring way possible. And then, of course, I rediscovered Creature in the Pit. I found Creature in the Pit and thought, well, that was a bit on the trite side. It wasn't that good. You know, wasn't that clever, really. And then Logopolis was just depressing. And then Time Flight was just really embarrassing. Really embarrassing. And then, of course, Arkham Infinity was just dull and leading. And Warriors of the Deep was kind of... Yeah, I'm not just seeing why the show got cancelled. It's I'm seeing that, you know, the show is allowed to carry on too long and become really moribund and horrible. And I always felt there was something nasty about it always felt there was something nasty about it and to be honest it's one of those stories that makes me think you know what maybe the BBC didn't cancel the show soon enough because that was so bad and even compared to a lot of Jodie's stuff there's been since I still think Warriors League was bad I mean when the show came back in 2005 there was this reassuring sense that you could discount a lot of the embarrassing stuff in the 1980s. You know, technically speaking, you could almost just imagine that the classic, classic series ended on Hand of Fear with Sarah Jane saying goodbye. You know, so much of the Russell T. Davis era, that's how it felt. It felt almost like, you know, yeah, there's been a dust settling period. You can just, you know, remember the show and it's, you know, imagine the show picks up a from Classic Who at its prime, or indeed that this remake is just, this reboot is just kind of loosely based on Doctor Who, if you know what I mean. And that, that, that seems to be more the feeling. The feeling that this was kind of, they were deliberately making it not your daddy's Doctor Who. And now, of course, we're at a point where I think if you're giving up on the show and you're kind of deciding, well, where do you cut it off? I now too tend to think classic series and new series are two completely different beasts. I don't really care about the new series anymore. So where does that leave the 1980s for me? I feel like it was bad, but it had some gems in there. But crucially, it's important that it ended because it was pursuing something of a dead end anyway. And I'd rather it ended as it did on some kind of note of note redemption. But, you know, as long as it ends. You know, the version of Doctor Who we got in the 1980s is not one that I would want to continue. Because it, because it was a dead end. It was basically... It was the worst kind of Doctor Who. It was moribund. It was kind of... And it was more because of bad kind of management. You know, it's like I said, the conditions in the, of the show in the 1980s where it was cheap and underfunded and all that, that should not have made it bad TV. In fact, it should have meant that we got art through adversity. And sometimes we did. But a lot of the time, the fact that the show was bad was just, it was bad for no good reason. There was no reason to make Twin Dilemma as charmless and as unpleasant a script as possible with as unpleasant a doctor as we got. And, you know, a lot of it can seem like, you know, we're, we're saying that in retrospect, but a lot of it should have been obvious at the time. It did feel like once Jonathan Turner took over, it, you know, the before Jonathan Turner took over, a lot of these, you know, stories like Twin Dilemma, Warriors of the Deep, Ark of Infinity, these would have been ideas that, you know, if someone had proposed these ideas to Philip Hinchcliffe or Rob or Robert Holmes or Graham Williams, they probably would have dismissed them out of hand and said, no, that's not what we want to do. That's the last thing the show should be doing. You know, it's Twin Dilemma? No way. Why would we want to do a story like Twin Dilemma that introduces such a horrible, unlikable doctor? You know, why would we why would the audience want to see the doctor strangle his companion? 
most of them would say no. And it's like one Jen Lathan Turner took over. It's almost like the wisdom of producers past who knew that was a bad idea was kind of, it was lost. It was undone. It was almost like there was no point to previous producers being that wise if, if that good work was going to be thrown away. And so it was a mess. And I think, yeah, if John Nathan Turner probably should have left on time flight, you know, someone else should have taken over. Um, it could have worked out, might not have, or, but it seemed like the BBC decided if they were going to continue the show, then they should have just, then they could only keep, then there was no one else they could get to run the show. And so it was stuck with bad management because it was bad man management or no management. And, um, or maybe they might have found a replacement for John Nathan Turner who was worse, who didn't have anywhere near John Nathan Turner's enthusiasm. So it could have ended up worse and we could have ended up not getting the gems we did. And there's always ways it could have been worse. Even though sometimes it looks it looks like there's no way it had to be that bad. But who knows? The eighties was a mess with promise, I suppose. And in the end, it probably got a mercy killing. And I understand why a lot of fans are feeling like it needs a mercy killing again. Maybe they should have just ended it when Tom left. Maybe they should have. Maybe there was not much more to do with the show after that. Or maybe they should have ended on the five doctors at least, you know. That would probably be ideal, but it's not what happened. We are where we are with the show. And it's a darn shame. And even years, decades on, it still feels wrong. Still doesn't quite make sense how it ended up that way. But anyway, I suppose the past really is another country. The 80s especially so. So anyway, this is Sadako24, signing out.